My talk is a cognitive perspective on pretend play in language and language in evolution and development. I'm going to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. So first, I will kind of give you a brief definition and outlook on the development of pretend play in humans. Um, and then I will ask the question, can we find pretend play in non-human animals? Um, I will then kind of take on a kind of the evolutionary perspective and ask what are the functions of pretend play in humans and what does that tell us about pretend play and language and its relation to evolution. Right, so some definitional features of pretend play often found in the literature are that pretend play can be defined as the enactment of imagination, where basically what you do in a way is project an alternative reality onto a target reality. So here we have a, you know, a mouse and what's projected on it is it's a telephone. So we can say that there's a symbolic as if or stand for relation in pretend play. And this, uh, at least at some point in development, also involves a mental representation or awareness of this pretend relation. One further distinction that we have to make when we talk about pretend play is that between these two types of pretend play, and that is object substitution, like in this, um, like the mouse is like a telephone, and role play, which comes later and is a lot more complex. Object substitution is something that's representational, and it's not social content that is um, kind of pretended. So when we look at object substitution and pretense, what we're interested in is how does this relate to symbolic and semiotic development? For role play, very much we're interested in how um, does this kind of have an interplay with social development, and that's why kind of pretend play is interesting for looking at language acquisition and language um, evolution because it's relevant for symbolic development and social development. So a very very brief outlook of how pretend play develops, like, typically, is that around 12 months of age, we have the first emergence of pretend acts. We have very simple object substitutions. So, like, pretending to drink from a cup, for example. Uh, 15 to 18 months, this really increases quite dramatically. And in 18, at 18 months, we had the proper start of pretend play with actually kind of pretend play combinations. So whereas at the beginning before that, we have like drinking from a cup. At 18 months, people, um, kind of children start, or infants do, start doing things like they have like um, an empty glass and then they pour water into another glass and then drink from that. So we start getting pretend combinations in actions. At 24 months of age, pretend play is said to be in full swing, and children spend about 5 to 20% of playtime uh, engaging in pretend activities. At 30 months um, is when we start renaming, and also where children become a lot more active in terms of their own initiative with pretend play. Before that, it's very often still scaffolded by cultural artifacts and by caregivers. This is where they become a lot more kind of self-propelled in what they do. Um, mostly three to four years old children start to talk, um, to engage in pretend play with pairs. So there's also a lot more negotiation going on in the linguistic dimension, because before that, the caregivers are very much attuned and scaffolding the pretend play. And three to four years is when, really, they become more active and also linguistically negotiate pretend play. Four years is often seen as the peak of the pretend play activity. But by five years, that is when we really see that pretend play is understood as a mental activity. So one thing is that if you ask children to pretend to brush their teeth, uh, at 30 months, they need some object like this to brush their teeth. Then around four years, when you ask them, they need 
they can use parts of their body as a pretend, but they still need a stand-in, so they brush their teeth like that. Only when they're five years old, they can use an invisible toothbrush to brush their teeth. So kind of in terms of the embodiment and the cultural artifacts bound to pretend, we do see kind of this distancing and this kind of becoming more abstract. One way of testing this is the so-called Mo the Troll experiment by Angeline Lillard, where she basically presented kind of children with this troll, and she said, OK, the troll hops like a kangaroo and jumps like a kangaroo, but Mo doesn't know what a kangaroo is. Is Mo pretending to be a kangaroo? So adults would say, no, you can't pretend something when you don't know what um, that one is, but children before they are five years of age will say, yes, Mo pretends to be a kangaroo, which seems to indicate that at the beginning they very much conceptualize or think of pretending as something that you do. So pretend is acting as if, and the representational dimension is not something that's still fully conceptualized. So what about pretend play in non-human animals? And pretend play is kind of a complex concept, so we can first start asking about play. So play and play fighting is actually seen in a lot of species. This is play fighting in rats, where what you see is that they kind of try to bite each other and, and chase each other all around the room. And then you, you see the kind of go nuzzle to, you know, to the neck and, and kind of bite, um, bite each other. Um, typical kind of play fighting that you can actually find in a lot of animals. Um, what's the evolutionary function of play fighting? So play fighting is often kind of hypothesized to be a rehearsal and practice of fighting skills. And for example, Pellis and Pellis argue um, that in rats, actually, you can see that it has positive eff effects on the development of coordination of social interactions and emotional regulation. And one important kind of thing here when we talk about play fighting is the degree to which it is symbolic. So it, because it, as, you, as you see, signal, there's signals to play fighting. There's like uh, ultrasonic high-pitched vocalizations, and they also nuzzle a different area than in actual fighting. So they're clear, clear, clear signals that kind of indicate this is play. Um, and these kind of meta-communication systems we can find actually in a lot of different animals. So dogs have the play bow, where they kind of go, go down to indicate, OK, I want to play. And in chimpanzees, for example, in gorillas, we have the play face that indicate signal that is something that is play. So it's clearly it's kind of um, their signals, but like the symbolic dimension is play signaling and then therefore kind of pretend signaling, does it have a symbolic structure? And there are um, some people who say, yeah, because it's a stand for relation. It's a stand for relation. Um, so we can say that it actually kind of, in, in essence, is symbolic. If we look at primates, primates also play a lot. It has been described as a prolonged phase of exploration and as a low-cost way to develop alternate responses to new and challenging environments. And that's why primates, when you look at um, kind of animals, that we already saw that they have like a prolonged phase of, um, of, kind of um, infancy and kind of, kind of juvenile, being juvenile, but also kind of play has kind of a function. There's a lot of object play. So in human children, it's about 15% of the time um, when they play kind of children uh, perform object play. In wild chimpanzees, it's about 10%, um, according to, to one estimate. And play, so we can see, is something that we can find in a large variety of species. What about language-trained apes? So pretend play, do we, can, can, can we see that something properly symbolic play? Um, this is something that's you know, widely debated. I want to show you two examples from um, the late Gorilla Coco. Um, so this is um, video courtesy of Marcus Perlman on where you have um, Coco the gorilla and she's playing with a doll. The case sound of print doesn't work. Um, you will see that she, you know, Ophus has a has you know has a doll, kisses the doll, 
and kind of clearly plays, it's, it's like it's her baby. And now she, she gestures eat. And now she takes something that represents, you know, something to eat, and she chooses, and now she feeds the dog. Uh, now there's a doggy, and you have to kiss, kiss the doggy, and the doggy um, wants to kiss um, the doll. And this is um, something that's often interpreted as you know, pretend play, because kind of it's an as-if behavior. Kind of, she's not really, the baby is not, you know, real, um, really a baby, and she's kind of, she's feeding, kind of acting as if she was feeding. Um, this is another example where Coco is imitating, um, thank you, or pretending to be on the telephone. So she takes the telephone, um, because we don't have audio, there's something we can't hear, so she looks at the telephone, and she puts it to her mouth, and she actually makes these <laughs> Um, kind of gestures. You can now kind of, kind of, kind of see it. That she goes like, mm, mm. and she again kind of looks at the telephone. And now she actually, um, in in a moment, will kind of dial a number because that kind of belongs to to it. So, okay. And now presses, you know, presses the number, presses another number because that's. And now, and now talking. And now talking again, kind of moving and kind of huffing and puffing. Um, so these, in kind of when we present um, kind of language trained animals with enculturation and with cultural artifacts that they can interact with, um, then we do see these kinds of play behaviors, which is uh, quite, quite interesting as when we think about like the um, cultural foundation, the uh, biological foundations of this kind of play behavior and kind of symbolic behavior. What about evolution and the evolutionary functions of um, pretend play and its relation to language evolution? That's what I want to talk about um, next. And what we, of course, have to ask is, is pretend play actually a phenomenon that is universal? Um, and so Susan Gaskins, for example, who did a lot of research on that, says not only do all children play, all children appear to engage in play that is symbolic, involving both object substitution and enactment of roles and scripts. So we can say pretend play seems to be universal, and also it seems to be universal in timing and appearance. However, of course, we have to um, make some ca caveats, and that is there is lots of cultural variation in frequency and expression. So if we look at weird cultures, so this um, acronym by Henriks and colleagues about Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic cultures. These are very, very different. Weird cultures are very different from basically from all other cultures. That's why they're called weird, because very often they're the outliers. So in weird cultures, we have inventive pretend play. So what if behavior? So very complex things, I'm a superhero, or um, what about I can fly? That's not something we have in all cultures. What we do have in all cultures is we have so-called interpretative pretend play that is as if behavior, where children actually kind of pick up on things and kind of rehearse and pretend to do things that actually exist in their cultural environment. Um, the fact that it is universal in timing and appearance um, suggests an evolved behavior. And that is why the question why it's kind of what the function is, is quite interesting. And if also in terms of functions, that means we should look at interpretative pretend play. So as if behavior is something that has deep evolutionary roots. So functions of pretend play and the development of pretend play that have been proposed are, for example, psychological distancing. So because I'm kind of decoupling from a representation, I'm decoupling from an object, that this is not um, kind of a mouse anymore, like a computer mouse. It's actually it's a telephone. Um, we saw that it's um, semiotic development, and there's like research on that, the kind of symbolic dimension, the more complex pretends gets, the more kind of complex these kind of symbol relations get. Social cognitive development also very much involved in it because I have to communicate about pretend and kind of have to arrive at a shared perspective. 
And that is why um, Return play has been argued to lead to the internalizations of perspectives. So by trying to share a perspective with somebody, I first become aware that they're different perspectives. And the emergence of kind of a we perspective, like when I pretend that we have to kind of coordinate and negotiate roles and kind of arrive at, at, a, shared, um, at a kind of a shared perspective. And um, Hannes Kakochi has called it the cradle of shared intentionality. So joint goals, plans, joint intentions, and so forth. That's something that you do find in pretend play very, very early. Um, something about this, of course, is um, that in terms of social cognitive development, it's this very much a dynamic process. So sharing of perspectives, it's not just you know the child doing something, but it's like an interactive um, dynamic process where caregiver and child kind of in, interact. And at the beginning, especially, it's very much um, guided by caregivers. Um, other functions of pretend play, kind of in the, some of them in the non-social domain, are executive functions, so things like inhibition, working memory, cognitive flexibility, and planning, problem solving, and decision making have all been found to correlate positively with um, the development of perspective take, uh, of um, pretend play. Um, pretend play generally also has been argued to facilitate children's learning because it helps them to explore reactions to various situations and also in terms of mental time travel, that they can like practice things that might happen in the future, practice things that might have happened, kind of rehearse them. Um, pretend themes, interestingly, become a lot more complex as children progress. So they, um, the ability to imaginatively manipulate various scripts, event scripts, that is something that really changes. And so we can, so one kind of key function of pretend play probably is to rehearse and acquire scripts, schemas, and roles. And that's also something where we have um, like ethnographic evidence for it. Um, for example, in um, this um, time allocation study by Bock and Johnson of a hunter-gatherer group in the um, Okavango Delta, they found that playtime, so how much time children spend playing or pretending certain things correlates with the likely roles in adulthood and the difficulty of the skill. So preparing grains is something that um, many girls, for example, would spend more time with and kind of shooting bow and arrow, and even pretending to shoot bow and arrow would be something that um, boys would tend to um, spend more time on. And also because kind of, you know, weaving a basket, for example, is quite easy, Kind of that this is, occupies less pretend time. Um, so we can say that the function of pretend play it can be seen as a communal way for children to make sense of the world they share today and the world they will come to participate in together tomorrow. Um, this, of course, is also related to language because language is involved in this kind of pretend and there's a feedback loop. So language and pretend play are closely related. Pretend play increases sensitivity to social signals and it enables symbolic interpretation of behavior. So pretend play can be seen as a training ground for language acquisition and the linguistic negotiation of perspectives. And indeed, uh, Jerome Bruner and Trevor Smith both argue that so the most complicated grammatical and pragmatic forms of language appear first in play activity as something we can rehearse these. And in pretend play, children regularly negotiate shared symbolic meanings and coordinate ideas and intentions. So that means that kind of symbolic ability and social cognition interact with pretend play and meta communication also. <coughs> kind of interacts with pretend play and all these together kind of then feed back into and are connected to language acquisition. And if we see these capacities here as foundational uh, for complex language acquisition, then these are also highly relevant for language evolution. And this brings me to my conclusion that pretend play plays an important role in cognitive and linguistic development. It is undergirded by symbolic ability in non-human animals and human children. 
the functions are that it, it's rehearsing and internalizing of roles, frames, and scripts. And it is a training ground for the use and acquisition of linguistic strategies for the negotiation of perspectives. So in the course of the evolution of language, pretend play, um, that's a hypothesis, acted as a context and breeding ground for the development of certain linguistic skills. And it still does so ontogenetically. Thank you very much.